Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Sussman, COO of the Institute for Advertising Ethics, the IAE. The IAE is an educational nonprofit that administers the ethics certification for advertising professionals. All of us understand how lapses in ethical due diligence can devastate companies, careers, and people. Professionals and publics are increasingly conscious of misinformation, particularly greenwashing. In this session, we will reveal tools and frameworks that can help professionals identify and mitigate the risks of greenwashing. Today, we're proud to be able to introduce Joe Mendezi as the moderator of our session. Joe is the longstanding editor of the Post. Media Post is the largest circulation media and advertising trade. Consequently, Joe serves as the institutional memory of our business, and Joe is known as one of, if not the most intelligent, articulate, and prolific voices in the industry. One of them. I give you Joe Mendezi. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, let me start off with a fact check, since we're talking about facts and truth, and and um, Media Post is not the largest, but one of the largest ad trades. So thank you for promoting us. Um, but I've covered advertising and media for 40 years at most of the leading U.S. trade magazines. I'm the editor there. And uh, one of my favorite subjects to cover is, um, you know, regulation, self-regulation and liabilities that the industry faces and how it deals with it. And there have been all kinds of solutions over the years that I've observed. Um, you know, probably the biggest highlight comparable to what's going on now with uh, greenwashing has been the tobacco litigation and settlements and how that industry has responded or not. Um, but in just the last few months, I think the pace of change has been not breathtaking, but surprised me how quickly it's become an industry issue, starting with um, the congressional subcommittee hearings a couple of months back. And one of our speakers, um, Christine Arena, spoke very eloquently there and I thought offered some very practical solutions that are a good start for this symposium today about how we can develop frameworks and tools. Uh, just let me go through the speaker list um, so we know who's um, participating. So we have Christine, who's CEO of Generous Films. We have Ben Franta, who's Senior Research Fellow for Oxford Sustainable Law Program. He spoke at the last symposium. If you haven't had a chance, you should go back and look at it because it really addressed the issues that led up to today's webinar. Um, then we have Dr. Steph Hill, who's co-author of the Integrated Framework for Assessing Greenwashing at the University of Leicester. And uh, she's going to really drill down into some um, what I would describe as a taxonomy for understanding how to manage the process. And then we're going to have Laura Brett, who's Vice President National Advertising Division of the better of the BBB National Programs, which probably is the best example of a self-regulatory body dealing with um, messaging and advertising claims in the US right now. Um, so just to, um, to wrap up my perspective here, um, I was a little surprised um, by some of the disclosures that were made during the congressional hearings uh, in terms of the magnitude uh, and, and the spectrum really of how different agencies, advertisers and PR firms and, and some mm, below the line uh, lobbyists and consultants were aggressively trying to, um, how should I say, displace the truth during this uh, campaign against uh, climate change. And uh, I don't wanna editorialize here uh, but I'm, I'm just playing the role as a moderator, so I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, but I think it was revealed that, you know, most of the players are not bad actors. They're probably making mistakes that aren't willful, but negligent. But there are some really bad actors in the pot here, too. And as Ben Franta um, presented in the last symposium, there's a lot of liability here. There's tons of litigation taking place worldwide in the US too, and the severe penalties. So, um, you know, during the preamble for this webinar, we spoke a little bit about uh, why industries um, self-regulate. And yes, the truth is they do it to prevent liabilities and, and mitigate, you know, dangers that could threaten their businesses and their revenues. But the other thing is it is a spectrum. There are a lot of people who really care 
on Madison Avenue about fixing this problem. The major agency holding companies and, and smaller and independent agencies, many of them have already pledged to net zero and, and more advanced forms of dealing with climate change, including programs that are taking place now with Ad Net Zero and others to actually reduce carbon emissions generated from advertising and media. So they, they, they are on board with that. The problem is they generate revenue from clients who ask them to position a message for them. Um, just since the congressional hearings, we've already seen one of the big agency holding companies, Interpublic, who was also mentioned in, in that hearing um, as a bad, bad actor, um, made a, a policy change. They said they're not gonna take on any new energy clients that don't adhere to their own corporate policies with regard to net zero. I'm not sure how that plays out in the real world of how they work for that client, but at least they made a public statement about it. And I think that's a positive sign of the direction the industry is going in. Um, so again, I thought the um, remarks made by um, Christine Arena during the hearings and also in the last webinar offered some simple solutions, but you know, the, putting these things into practice isn't always so easy. So what we're gonna hear from all of our speakers today is how do we actually you know, implement it? How do we build the framework? How do we develop tools for mitigating the liability, but also more importantly, doing the right thing? Um, look, energy is a part of our society and our world, um, but you know there are better and worse ways of promoting brands involved in energy. And, and I think the most important part to Ms. Arena's uh, point was, um, you know, it's about disclosure. And lastly, if I could say, over-indexing. I think the biggest takeaway I've taken over the last few months is it isn't necessarily that fossil fuel companies can't make these claims. It's that they are making them disproportionate with what they're really doing in the real world. Um, and I think that's, to me, the hook. And I did write a column, which I labeled um, omissions offsets, it's kind of a pun on emissions offsets, which a lot of companies use to, to make their net zero goals. Well, I think an omissions offset, however that gets implemented, is basically saying, if you're gonna make this aggressive claim for improving the planet through your energy policies, you better make sure you'll have equal voice or um, fair play for what you're not doing and what is the proportion of that claim. So on that note, um, I think this is a good chance to turn it back over to Christine so she could elaborate more on how she's organized uh, this view of uh, greenwashing. So thank you very much. I think we're gonna hand it to Steph Hill um, to show the framework. Uh, Sorry. Joe, if that's okay, because that might be a really nice way to start. Yeah, I apologize. Um, I'm looking at two different sets of notes here. So thank you for cueing me. I'm supposed to do that. So if we could go back to Steph Hill, this is probably the meat of what you're gonna to see today because this is a very thoughtful and organized framework. Um, Dr. Hill is a co-author of, but you know, a very high level of academic research explaining what the spectrum currently is and how you can organize claims about climate change and um, greenwashing. So thank you, Dr. Hill. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to share my screen because this is a framework that works better maybe visually than it does orally. So this presentation is based on a paper that me and my co-authors worked on that tried to bring together conversations about greenwashing that were happening in a couple of different spheres. So there were academic definitions of greenwashing being presented at the same time. NGOs and consulting groups were offering their own definitions of greenwashing sins or ways to avoid greenwashing. And there were sort of competing definitions going around. So why we made this framework was to try and bring together these conversations into a single tool that might um, help sort of push this conversation forward and um, make it more specific in some ways. So um, these are my co-authors. I'm here presenting on behalf of the group and I just want to um, especially lift up Noemi Neem's work here because she's been really leading the charge um, and is on a well-deserved vacation right now. Um, our group is part of the Climate Social Science Network. Uh, I encourage anyone who's sort of interested in these ideas, um, certainly anyone who's interested in advertising ethics, we 
do a lot of work across greenwashing and PR and these different processes in climate change. Um, and I think it's bringing social science questions to this research in a way that's really needed. I think for a long time, we kind of hoped that just telling people the hard science would somehow like result in the changes we wanted. And so it's great to see these growing frameworks and um, networks of academics working on the social science part of it. Okay, so just at a really basic level, the integrated framework to assess greenwashing is a diagnostic tool that we put together that is built to assess a specific claim at a specific time and try and figure out whether it counts as greenwashing or not. Um, we're relatively confident that it's pretty good because we incorporated all the frameworks that we could find up till mid 2021 when the article went to print. Um, we drew on academic sources, but we also tried to reach out to other um, communities that were trying to tackle this issue. And then we took not only the definitions from those, um, from all these different competing frameworks and tried to bring them together into one comprehensive framework, but we also took these more actionable parts about trying to diagnose greenwashing. What makes something vague? How would you define vagueness? What makes something an irrelevant claim? How would you define it? Um, so while we're really confident that we've sort of captured as much as we could up to that point, we're also aware that this is a really dynamic space and we expect that this framework will change and hopefully improve as, um, as we learn more about this and, and as it needs to. So what's actually in it, um, from this research, we pulled together 13 top level instances, sort of like big claim, instances of greenwashing. Um, so some of them is like selective disclosure. You go, oh, we're so green in this corner of our business. And you just sort of like forget about emissions or forget about some other faux pas somewhere else. Empty claims, things that you can just say whatever you want. It doesn't necessarily align with what you're doing. Um, and it goes, I don't want to say down the list because this isn't this isn't a weighted lift. We're not saying selective disclosure is the worst flavor of greenwashing, but it includes things all the way from outright lies about actions to something that might seem a little bit more technical, like throwing different jargon out there that might not be well understood um, to most consumers. And that might help to sort of confuse what exactly the claim being made is. Um, and so I'm aware that this is a really big list. And so I'm gonna try and go through a couple specifics to show A, how the framework works um, in and of itself, and then how it might be applied to a specific green claim. And then I'll just close up by talking a little bit about what we think it might do or be for in the future. So if you actually look at the framework, it looks like this. And one of the most challenging things about talking about this framework is the um, the spreadsheet that we made is too big to fit on a screen, and it makes it a real challenge to show it all at once. Um, and so I tried to zoom in on a specific instance here. You can see that on our left-hand column, you have the overarching um, greenwashing activities, the empty claim. We have a little definition next to it explaining sort of generally what that might mean about exaggerating achievements or just saying things that you don't intend to actually live up to. Um, but I think where it becomes a really useful diagnostic tool is in the third column where you actually have questions going, are there strong indicators that the overall marketing budget is larger than the actual activities that are being marketed, for instance? This would be a tip off that this is sort of a greenwashing empty claim. It's being made so you can say something, it's not made so that the organization might do something. Um, and then you have sort of, depending on your answer to that, you can find out whether that was greenwashing or isn't greenwashing, or if you don't have enough information to tell. And then um, this is the part that always gets cut off. We have notes on the far column, bringing up some of the research that might link to this, or that might give you more um, information about these specific claims. Um, that all seems, I hope, relatively straightforward as a tool to use, but I just wanted to go through a bit of an example. So 
the way that we anticipate this being used in practice is in cases like this. So fairly recently, um, British Cycling in the UK, where I live now, announced this eight-year partnership with Shell. Um, and part of the partnership, you'll see it in their third bullet point at the bottom, was that Shell was going to help British Cycling meet its own net zero targets and encourage this low carbon um, transition in transport. And so when this happened, there was a lot of outcry about it. People going, this seems fishy. This seems like greenwashing. Something's not right here. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit hard to tell, right? Like, is that actually greenwashing or is that just, you know, not your preference for who would sponsor a cycling group? Um, and so I pulled out this example so we could take it to the test. So like, it looks like an endorsement's happening here. Shell's endorsing British Cycling. They're making a claim about net zero. Does it pass a co-opted endorsement test? So the co-opted endorsement test has two questions. Um, one of them is more about an organization stepping in to sort of like co-sign someone else's claim. But the second one I thought was more relevant to this, which is whether an organization that's receiving funding from another organization that is greenwashing, um, is it sort of helping to endorse that funding body's greenwash tactics? So in this particular example that I use, British Cycling is definitely receiving payment from Shell and saying that this is part of their own net zero journey, which is co-signing Shell's ostensible net zero journey. Um, and we know from other research that where Shell is on net zero is, is basically nowhere. It, it appears to meet what we would call an empty claims um, test. They say a lot of things, but there's not a lot of proof that they're on track to meet those um, those targets. So under the framework, this endorsement looks like a greenwash um, that British Cycling is helping Shell sell this fiction, as far as we know, until they come up with better proof that they're on track for net zero. So with this sort of test in mind, I want to talk a little bit about who we thought this was actually for, what this framework might be used for. Um, we know that there's been activity, and we're going to hear more about this in like legal spaces. We know here in the UK, there's um, there's a green claims code, and you can be sued or you can be asked to re retract advertising. Um, but we found that a lot of these frameworks didn't account for um, non-business actors. So they didn't account for certification schemes necessarily. They didn't account for nonprofits and other organizations that might be um, engaging in greenwashing. And so when we published it, we were hoping that it might be sort of find different life with different organizations depending on their needs. And so far it's, it's looking good. So we've seen it picked up in some academic circles and trying to define instances of greenwashing or use it as a way to interpret communicative activity from different businesses. But we've also seen groups like the Network for Business Sustainability take it as a framework to sort of educate their members about what's greenwashing and what are good practices to sort of make sure that you're not going on the wrong side of that line. Um, so they put together a really great sort of infographic that they're sharing with their um, members and that I've linked to you right there. Um, for the future of this framework, I'm really curious actually, because it does really feel like we're in a point, maybe an inflection point. People are talking about greenwashing a lot, but I feel like they're talking about greenwashing a lot because it's happening a lot. And you're seeing these different tools appear, um, different legal frameworks appear, and there's sort of competition in this space about how are we gonna define it? How are we gonna act on it? How are we gonna respond to it? And I really hope that this framework is part of sort of a broader response that helps us be co coherent about how we're understanding this issue and how we're responding to it. Um, we're seeing it in places like the New Climate Institute report on net zero on corporate claims. There's a real um, push for accountability in these spaces. And I really hope that this framework's part of that and can continue to um, evolve with it. 
Um, and then I just wanted to close by specifically talking about advertisers and greenwashing. I know there's going to be more on that, but just to sort of set the scene, um, I think for advertisers, there are some really specific risks and ethical questions that come up about greenwashing. Um, I think the, the starting point is the content, right? Like, are you putting out ads that are greenwash claims? That's one issue, and that can be within the power of specific ad budgets or specific teams. Um, but there's big questions about industries, like so far as most of the evidence is so far, the fossil fuel industry is not putting forward credible claims to being on track to decarbonize. So can you put a green claim out on behalf of that industry? Would any of it pass? Um, you can also see, like, I know advertising is often hived off from the rest of the organization. So there can be miscommunications between what the organization is actually doing and what they incredibly claim. And then a specific one that I'm really interested in watching is there's a lot of misinformation outlets that are taking advantage of how advertising works online, for instance. And so you can put out the best ad that you can and it can end up on a misinformation site. And so vetting publications who you're working for and making sure that the credibility is not just with the claim, but also sort of throughout the, the life cycle of an advertising campaign, for instance. So I hope that sort of sets the stage for this conversation. I'm really curious about the discussions that's gonna follow and I will close it right there. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill. Uh, on that last note, I think the IAE just did put out um, a new policy and has a new effort about dealing with um, uh, what we call advertising fraud, which is when ads show up in nefarious places like misinformation sites. So those initiatives are afoot already. So on that note, um, now we can hear from Christine Arena, uh, who um, has some very practical insights about how to deal with um, greenwashing. Uh, thank you. Well, I would just say that, you know, thank you to Dr. Hill and to the entire team that put together the integrated framework to assess greenwashing. I think that framework is so valuable because it provides our industry with the first shared taxonomy for assessing the validity and the integrity of green claims made. And Joe, like you said in your, your intro, uh, this is a problem that is worsening. Uh, we not only have a the, not only is the quality of greenwashing becoming more distorted, more confusing to consumers, but there is more of it. Um, this issue of over-indexing is really important because we, the highest polluting industries and companies, some of the highest polluting industries and companies spend the most marketing and over-promoting their green claims. So there is a big gap between green claims made and investments made. Um, at the same time, they're over-promoting their green activities. Uh, they are not disclosing the risks of their products, so, right? So it's a combination of non-disclosure and over-promotion. Now, that formula alone in the eyes of some lawmakers is a recipe for fraud. But then when we look more closely at the nature of greenwashing, the quality of greenwashing and how it's shifted in recent years, you know, five or 10 years ago, it was easier to detect misleading environmental ads, misleading environmental communications, because they very often contained blatant lies or blatant uh, climate denial rhetoric. Today's ads contain a combination of factual omissions, such as the core business omissions Dr. Hill just mentioned, factual distortions, confusing and conflating terms, uh, what we call paltering. That's language that's not an outright lie, but it sends the wrong impression like lower carbon, cleaner burning, uh, emissions intensity. These types of terms sound great, but in reality, they don't mean what people, what, what, what they should mean. Uh, and, and, and then we also have companies and industries really relying on what we call climate delay frames, which are these rhetorical themes that we see popping up in ad after ad after ad. Uh, such as the theme that fossil fuels are a solution to the climate crisis, this pushing of non-transformative solutions. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of sort of projecting the blame or the focus onto the individual consumer, um, suggesting that it's the consumer's job to, to clean up their act and use less energy, not the uh, energy companies, for example. So it is very common to see all of what I just described within a single ad or campaign. 
that is why uh, it, it's so important to have these social science-based frameworks that are rooted in the nature of modern uh, climate disinformation, climate misinformation, and modern greenwashing. Um, if we came together as an industry to acknowledge these current challenges and uh, use these shared taxonomies, I think we would be steps ahead in terms of our effective self-regulation. Uh, our industry self-regulation must focus on the core problems, because those problems are driving risks facing agencies, facing advertisers in terms of litigation. So we have to, as an industry, come together, adopt these proven frameworks and, and, and approaches, and, and really close those gaps. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Christine. Um, so on that note, uh, we did, I did mention that Dr. Frank Franta already did a very in-depth presentation in the last symposium, but specifically, can you speak about how um, you can, how the industry can apply these types of frameworks to help reduce risk for, for the ad industry itself, if you can? Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I come at this from the legal perspective and, and the research perspective. And just to put this in context, since 1986, there have been around 2000 climate related lawsuits filed. Um, and that might surprise you. I know it surprised me when I learned that there were climate lawsuits as far back as the 1980s. But what's really key to, to understand is that half of those have been filed in the last seven years and a full quarter of those over 500 suits have been filed in the last two years. So what we're seeing is an exponential growth in climate litigation and greenwashing litigation is a part of that. And it, it's looking more and more like it's a, um, it's a growth sector in climate litigation. There's more and more attention being placed on greenwashing. Um, you know, there are already some suits in particular in the United States, but also elsewhere that are consumer protection suits that in essence in their core are about or they include uh, greenwashing. So this is just to say that this is very live right now and and it it looks like it'll it'll keep growing. And you know as been as has been discussed, there there are a lot of ways of thinking about greenwashing. Uh, but there's there's sort of a rule of thumb that I I like to go to, which is does does this statement or omission, does it have a tendency to materially mislead a consumer or an investor for that matter? But, you know, overall, you have to look at it holistically overall in what it says and in what it doesn't say. Does it have a tendency to mislead someone who's not an expert in in that field? Just just, you know, a lay person passing by looking at that. And so that's when we get into issues where, you know, an advertisement that might be narrowly true, like uh, last year we, you know, planted 30,000 trees, say, um, that might be narrowly true. But if it omits a fact like, but we invested $10 billion in, in fossil fuel development, you know, that's when the overall picture is misleading for that, that consumer, for whoever is looking at that, that message. So it's that overall picture that is that is very important that's the i see that as the anchor that's the thing to keep in mind um but we see we see the potential for greenwashing and actual greenwashing occurring in a lot of different ways we see it in terms of what companies are are doing what they're actually doing and how they're portraying themselves so this includes things like net zero pledges it includes things like carbon neutrality um assertions, um, decarbonization statements, things like that. You know, it's, it's when you go to the airport and you see, you know, this flight is carbon neutral, which, you know, as far as I know is, is scientifically impossible. You see something like that. I mean, it's a pretty good um, bet that, that that statement is either actually false or, or misleading. We also see it in terms of product attributes. So advertising certain products or products in the pipeline um, in, in ways that can be misleading. So advertising natural gas as 
climate friendly or non-polluting. That's an example. We used to see a lot of advertisements to do with biofuels and algae biofuels that promoted that product as being essentially developed and ready and scalable when in fact none of those things were true. Um, we see a lot of advertising today to do with hydrogen fuel, which is um, worth a hard look, I think. And we also see it with carbon capture and offsetting. Those are a couple, just a couple of areas where we're seeing a lot of um, potentially misleading communications. Now, how to reduce the risk? I mean, the easy answer is to tell the truth, but of course the truth it goes beyond just the narrow statement. So, uh, you know, there's a phrase I like to <laughs> I like to remember, which is something can be a micro truth while it, while it's still a macro lie, and that's how you know we know that it's possible to deceive by by leaving out key details, by decontextualizing a statement, by um, being overly vague, and, and so on. So that's that's really the thing to think about is how to give an overall truthful um, communication about whatever is being advertised for whatever kind of client that is. Um, and then finally, I just want to note that that this is broadly applicable for many sectors. And I think that's also a trend that we're seeing. Obviously, the fossil fuel sector is in, in some ways the most um, obvious uh, industry that that this faces because it this the climate issue has to do with its core product um, but we're seeing more and more um, climate related advertisements or sustainability related advertisements from all sorts of sectors you know from auto manufacturers to airlines and even financial institutions banks and so on who are advertising themselves as being low carbon or on their way to net zero or advertising specific good deeds while perhaps omitting their own investments in the fossil fuel sector, for example. So there are a lot, this is applicable to many sectors and, you know, we're, we're starting to see more and more scrutiny of it, but, you know, just to sort of tie it all together, I think it's that look at the ad and think overall, you know, what does this say and what does this not say? And all and those things together, does it have a tendency to, to mislead um, about this product, about this, this company um, overall? And I think that's at least a starting point for reducing risk and, and avoiding greenwashing because who wants to be subject to, to liability for greenwashing? I don't think anybody does. So, um, it's it's going to be an it is an important issue and i think given climate change is going to be with us for a long time i think it's going to be this is issue will be with us as well something to keep in mind thanks well i definitely have a follow-up question for you when we get to the end here dr frank Frantum, but that's very insightful um at this point we're going to turn it over to uh laura brett um you know in the united states we actually have laws on the books about um misleading claims and advertising fraud. Um, and there's probably no better representation of uh, self-regulatory adjudication of that than uh, what the National Advertising Division and, and the national programs have been doing. So I'm sure you've given some thought to this, uh, Laura, but if you could explain how you, what you see the role of the NAD, but the industry at, at large in mitigating um, greenwashing. Uh, thank you, and, and I, I appreciate being invited here to speak about BBB National Programs and National Advertising Division, particularly as we're talking about greenwashing and how to prevent uh, and minimize risks. Um, I heard Christine talk a little earlier about the industry needs to come together and really set, a, set, on, set some standards and create some accountability around these issues. Well, that's exactly what the advertising industry did in 1971 when it founded BBB National Programs, National Advertising Division. Um, we were uh, founded by the advertising industry to build consumer trust in ads. Um, and you know, right now, BBB National Programs has uh, over a dozen self-regulatory programs, many in advertising, but also in privacy and, um, and dispute resolution. Uh, but we see greenwashing as a problem at the National Advertising Division and, and in fact have tried to provide some guidance in the absence of something like the framework that Dr. Hill and her and her colleagues created. 
Um, and one of the first things we did in this space actually was uh, open some cases on our own. Most of the cases that we, we see are brought to us by competitors. Um, a competitor will see a misleading ad claim and challenge it. Um, and, and we resolve that um, in an adversarial like process. It's a little like litigation, but we're, we're, we're enforcing standards that are set by the FTC. But when we don't see claims being challenged, and that's what we saw with, with green claims, um, we'll open cases on our own. Um, and what we first tackled were these broad aspirational claims. Um, in, the, in the last two years, we've looked at claims um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Hill, I appreciated your specifics, so I want to quote specifically some of the claims that we we looked at in a in a recent decision uh, uh, related to Butterball, the the turkey manufacturer's advertising. But they were making claims that um, that making food they're they're making food in the most responsible, sustainable way, and that embracing sustainable practices defines a Butterball grower. Um, now, these are very broad sustainability claims, right? Broad claims about, you know, about the end product here and, and, and consumers take away a message that you really are doing this in the most sustainable way. Um, they were making some other narrow claims that we found to be substantiated, but these broad aspirational claims, um, we said we're, we're unsubstantiated, we're too broad for them to substantiate. That case and a few others like it, and not just on green claims, actually provided some guidance to the industry that these broad claims, these, these claims that sort of set your goals are claims that require support. Um, you know, uh, they, I, I think there was some sense that if it's so vague, it doesn't, it's, it's a claim that can't be proven. So therefore it doesn't, it, it's a claim that doesn't require support. But I think the message has gotten across to at least the major brands and a lot of them do follow our work um, that these aspirational claims require some support. Um, Unfortunately, we're still not seeing a lot of challenges. I mean, the, the industry can, advertisers can challenge each other's claims. So if one company gets this right, right, they're putting claims out in the marketplace about carbon neutrality or net zero, that they know that they're supporting with, with a, you know, a 20 or 30 year plan to achieve that, that and they, they, they understand how to achieve it and how to get there. They can challenge a competitor who's making those claims but they know doesn't have that hasn't done the hard work to make that plan. Um, we're not seeing those cases yet. Um, I hope we will. <laughs> but but um, but we did recently bring another claim that talks specifically about something that is addressed in your framework, Dr. Hill, um, and that was a, a, a case we brought against um, the American Beverage Association um, that was making a lot of recyclability claims. Uh, and the recyclability claims they were um, we found to be supported largely, but they were making claims about reducing their plastic, uh, their plastic footprint and specifically touting partnerships that they're, um, and one of them was working with the World Wildlife Fund through resource plastic initiative to reduce our plastic footprint. Um, we recommended they discontinue that claim because they are tracking the plastic foot footprint worldwide. And while they're they've made some progress in one year, they've made, they, they've seen an increase in plastic in, in other years. So, so while they're touting this partnership, uh, to, to produce results, they're not seeing those results, um, at least not yet. So, um, so we just said, you've got you've to reframe your ad claim to more specifically uh, tell consumers what exactly you're, you're, you're achieving. You can't just say this when you know you're not actually achieving it yet. Um, and, and they had another partnership that was talking about modernizing recycling infrastructure in communities across the country that we similar, similarly said, you're just not making enough of an impact yet to be touting this in this broad way. So there, you know, there is an opportunity for, um, for businesses to really reduce risk by supporting their own claims and then building consumer trust in these claims by challenging competitors. There's also an opportunity for the, the, the advertising industry to come together again and adopt standards, uh, you know, and I think Dr. Hill's framework is a, is a really great place to start. There is, you know, there, there are, are opportunities to use self-regulation to really build consumer trust in these claims. We want these claims to be truthful. We all do, right? You know, we all want companies to be doing the right thing and to be good stewards of our environment, but we don't want them to tell consumers they're being good stewards if they're not. And, um, and I think there, there are ways to minimize risk and I think self-regulation can be a major part of this. Okay. Um, well, I have a lot of questions, um, but I wanted to ask, was there anybody else participating from the IAE who wanted to do a follow-up at this point, or can I just go right into it? Ben, right? Yeah, Ben Downing, are, are you on? 
I sure am, Joe. Um, so I, I will give um, perhaps for a couple of minutes uh, our perspective from Madison Avenue um, in as much as I can and our, our perspective here at, at um, Habas. So I think what, um, what Dr. Franta set the context for in the previous session and today is the, lit is the litigation and legislation is coming. We should be aware that this is uh, a, a very real and in some cases um, existential risk. We're already seeing quite muscular action. So HSBC here in the UK has been told, for instance, that it must in the future acknowledge its role in the climate crisis after misleading uh, COP26 campaign. Um, and H&M, uh, I believe in, in the US, finds itself in, in court again around their, their conscious choice collection. Now, I don't believe that anyone in this industry, or rather I should say the vast majority of folks in this industry, uh, act with uh, with malice or, or deliberate intent to deceive or, or produce malpractice. I think the need is for education, and that's why this group is so important and why we must turn uh, to, uh, to you as leaders, um, but also to our colleagues in academia for these frameworks. This is complex, it's thoughtful. Uh, sometimes we need to take a, a step back and produce work that has uh, concrete grounding, um, which uh, uh, Dr. Hill has been kind enough to share today. Christine talked about, Christine Arena has talked, talked about non-disclosure and over-promotion. These are particularly complex, right, in the um, in the ad creation process, but also where those ads are showing up. Now, there's lots of good work already being done in the industry. Joe, you talked about AdNet Zero uh, at the start. We also have changed the brief um, here in the UK, which uh, allows us to sort of challenge and think about briefs. Um, and I should, you know, uh, talk about the work of um, folks like Clean Creatives, who kind of really start to push some of these conversations forward. Uh, but we must have uh, we must have these shared frameworks um, that Laura Brett um, was kind enough to uh, to talk about, and the need for the the industry to come together again uh, at this moment um, for for concrete, um, uh, real real frameworks that can help us uh, have this challenge. And I just say one more thing, which is we talked about uh, we talked about uh, you know. Um, we talked about misinformation and kind of misinformation science. I think the industry has done a, a very good job at this of uh, of starting to uh, to you know to not have major brands um, monetize or support this kind of content. But where it is, there's a you know there's, there's another risk here, which is your brand. Uh, there's an element of of uh, of co-opted um, distortion from the brand itself, right? If your if your brand is appearing on one of those sites, your brand is endorsing that kind of misinformation. So there's a you know there's a real risk there, um, and I'd I'd ask and I would suggest that uh, our colleagues in the media think about this, our colleagues as media owners, and I'll give you an example uh, of why they will benefit from this framework and this work as well. So you, all, you some of you will heard of Semaphore. It's a really exciting new startup. They're doing something different with news. Bill Spindle came on board to uh, to run uh, their their climate change um, uh, newsletter. It was going to be really good. It was it was good content. And of course, Chevron was sponsoring it, uh, and Bill actually left um, uh, following um, uh, following him feeling that that was the right thing to do. So that's an example of this this framework deciding if it's an appropriate thing and in action. And I'll leave us with with principle eight of the IEE principles. So as I said, I, I believe there are very few bad actors, but we need these frameworks to challenge and do better work. And principle eight of the IEE. Uh, really focuses on that. It is that advertising their agencies and online and offline media should discuss privately potential ethical concerns and members of the team creating ads should be given permission to express internally their ethical concerns. As we all do that with these frameworks, we will do better work. We will build better, more meaningful brands, as we say here at Avas, and we'll build a better industry and a better world. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, that was great. And actually, I'd like to follow up on the questions with that last point, Ben. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, one of the questions I have for uh, Dr. Pranter is, um, in all of those civil penalties and, and litigations that have taken place, have any of them exposed ad agencies directly themselves? Remember, it's the role of an ad agency or a PR firm or a lobbyist to present their client in the best possible light. So it's their tendency to 
promote it with what they have, unless there are laws or regulations or self-regulations to prevent it. So one of the things I want to know is, has there been direct exposure to agencies for any of these um, claims? And secondly, how would he advise agencies pushing back? And I'd also like to hear you, Ben, you alluded to it a little bit here. You know, Habas has a very ethical approach to this, I think. You have a lot of research invested in this, the meaningful brand studies, some of the more recent things you've been doing with programmatic, um, where it's part of your consultative approach to your clients. But I don't think all agencies do this. So basically, how do the does the ad industry push back on its fossil fuel clients? Thanks so much for those questions. So have PR companies and ad agencies been held li directly liable for this sort of greenwashing activity yet? To my knowledge, no. To my knowledge, no. And if anyone knows of any instance, please do let me know. Um, I would say no, not yet, because you know the the law the law is does evolve and there are a couple of other cautionary notes to, to place on this so typically it is the manufacturer of the product that is held liable um you know so it'd be the client um but um two notes one you know we saw in the recent opioid litigation in the united states that some of the strategic advisors for the industry mckinsey in that instance was held liable. Um, and so I think that that strikes a, a cautionary note in this space as well. And two, you know, even when there's not, um, you know, primary liability, there's reputational damage because that, you know, it, it does not look good when it's when it's splashed all over the place that, you know, this this ad agency or PR company um, helped the industry greenwash. Um, but it's a great question. And I, you know, it's one of these really important questions that I think has not yet been resolved yet quite, but it's a really important one to, to keep in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for that. Ben, any practical tools or suggestions for how agencies can push back and make sure their clients aren't overclaiming or over-indexing their claims? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the principle is one that the BBB National Programs was, was founded on, which is um, connecting with consumer trust, right? So we have the Meaningful Brand Survey. It's it's 400,000 uh, global citizens. We do it in about 30, 30 countries uh, now. And it consistently shows that consumers expect brands to play a good role in their lives and they expect them to be effective in, in change. But the last one we did was called the age of cynicism because consumers are increasingly smart, increasingly cynical, and they understand, right? That they, they, they start to identify misleading claims where ads are selling them something that isn't true or showing them something that isn't true. Um, so there's, there is a there is an issue with consumer trust. The way to do that is through better briefs. So change the brief is is worth checking out. It allows um, a, a way of getting to to challenge the brief whilst representing, of course, uh, brands in the best possible light. Um, I would also say, and you know, shameless plug for the IE here, I would say the CEAE certification starts to give some of that framework and, and, and help. Um, there are also, you know, lots of industry bodies like AdNet Zero starts to give some of those frameworks and uh, educating um, uh, educating teams in uh, in some of the, the issues here too. I would say um, educate us all, but challenge us all, right? Ultimately, it comes from the brief. Now, whether that be the creative work, the media work, but just tuning that and raising risk or raising opportunities to do better. I would, I would, I would put it that way. We just, uh, we just did a podcast um, uh, with um, a, a senior leader um, in uh, in one of the procurement groups, you know, and, and uh, they put it this way: they said next year is about doing better. Right. So use those tools to do better and frame the discussions and the work in that way. That was very wordy. I apologize. But, you know, I am a, a, a person. So forgive me. So, so Joe, I mean, Joe, can I just add one thing here? Um, uh, we, we really have to remember when we're when we're dealing with this issue that consumers really care about it. Uh, and um, what we call this is consumer information power. Uh, they can find out anything about any company, any agency. And they do. Uh, and uh, this issue of greenwashing is highly covered in the news and places, and, and consumers see this. Um, and the action they take often is online, in which they send their text about against a company and never doing business with this company. 
And I think that's very, very important. Also, I'd like to say that uh, that principle eight is very critical and it is very important for agencies as well as advertisers, because as we all know, advertisers will pay the penalty, but so will agencies who will be sued by the FTC and put under order as well. And so it's critical, and I know difficult, but it is very critical in those inner discussions that take place quickly that the agency stand up and say, look, this is gonna get us in trouble, we can't do it, and we've really gotta do it the correct way. Here's the way I would suggest we do it. So I think, again, I, I think that discussion here is critical before action is taken. And a lot of times clients are pushing for action uh, right away, and we have to really slow down and do it the right way. Thank you. That was um, fantastic. I, can I just jump in really quickly, Joe? Um, just one more, sorry. The one other thing I would say to um, to, to folks in, in Adland is um, listen to your your more junior talent right you're sort of you're sort of younger people who are who are coming they understand this ju just at an incredible level they see through uh, uh they see through the problems they can help you spot them early create an environment where they can speak openly because they will deliver better work for you so. right okay so we have a framework um scientific framework an academic research project um we have a lot of well-intentioned organizations, you know, uh, Ben, you mentioned Ed Net Zero and Carbon um, Neutral Media Planning and Buying. Uh, but it strikes me we're at a point in time that's not unlike consumer data privacy for the industry, where there was a huge liability being exposed and lots of different regulations, GDPR in Europe and then uh, California in the US and and lots of different attempts to 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 respond to it. My question is, how do we herd all the kittens that are taking place right now with greenwashing? How do we build a consensus? How do we build a self-regulatory process? And should there be an authority like the NAD or the IAE or some new entity to mitigate and, and adjudicate on this? So I can at least start that conversation. I mean, I think, um, I, I think there is an opportunity for self-regulation to provide some um, some guidance here. Um, you know, and, and I should say, Wally led the National Advertising Review Board. He was chair of the National Advertising Review Board, which is our appellate review board for the National Advertising Division for many years. So, um, so you know, I, I think we're aligned in understanding that there's, there's a lot of power that companies can bring using self-regulation. But if they're going to use self-regulation, it's got to be independent. I think that the, you know, the success of the NAD and, and, and I'm sure the IAE as well comes from the fact that it is independent of industry. Um, you know, regulators, advocates are very suspicious of something that comes from, from industry itself. So if you're going to self-regulate, you really need a, an independent um, self-regulatory body to, to review these, these issues. Great. If, if I could just interject and agree, uh, absolutely, with what Linda just said, and also just suggest the fact that it's not only an independent body that is needed, it is a focus on the burning problems facing our industry. God bless AdNet Zero. It's wonderful to for agencies to use renewable energy, uh, have their employees travel less and offset uh, the carbon emissions related to running an ad, but the core problems driving litigation and driving all the scrutiny that our industry is facing are the uh, over-indexing issue, which has a mathematical solution, right? We can figure out what's the fair proportion of over-promotion, how can we bring that down and modulate? Uh, because those advertisers are creating an environment that produces distrust, that, that consumers become more skeptical of all advertisers based on how severe that over-indexing is by certain advertisers. Second, in terms of looking at the nature of deceptive environmental communications and how it works today, our self-regulation should be focused on solving the pressing challenges and the modern ways uh, that misleading communications are, are, are not only constructed, but disseminated. Um, we also, you know, uh, my colleague Ben from Havas mentioned um, Bill uh, Spindle over at Semaphore, uh, who resigned over what he characterized as Chevron's sort of excessive role as the 
dominant advertiser against climate content. Now, the, the problem that Mr. Spindle pointed out is not unique to Semaphore. That is a systemic problem. Um, almost all climate content, uh, climate newsletters, uh, are sponsored by energy companies. Uh, New York Times, Politico, Washington Post, all have allow fossil fuel advertising against that climate content. And sometimes that advertising takes the form of an advertorial that is difficult for an average person uh, to discern whether that's actual editorial or, or an ad. So these problems have solutions. It's gonna take more than an agency brief. It's going to take an independent body, and it's going to take a, a focus on the driving challenges uh, that we need to solve. And by solving these challenges, we will not only be protecting ourselves as agencies, as, as uh, brand leads, but I think we will be improving the integrity of all communications that we produce if we abide by um, these standards. Well, so many questions. Let me get to, because we want to be practical here and offer tools to the industry. How do we ratify what, what you're talking about, Christine? How do we take that mathematical calculator that you talk, talk about and you, you can illustrate and create an industry standard? So everybody, the problem with ad net zero now is there's no unified carbon calculator for media. <laughs> We're still working on that. Um, how do we take the science and apply it in a way that people can use it? Well, first of all, again, the framework will help us proactively identify omissions and distortions that are very prevalent in most greenwashed ads. So we have a tool, we have the indicator questions. By doing that, by proactively correcting omissions and distortions, I feel that will make a big difference. In terms of over-indexing, I think in Europe, we may see a, a, an ad ban, a green ad ban. Um, it, we may see some action, you know, that will affect U.S. advertisers, um, but there is a lot of need for intervention because our industry is not self-correcting. Um, it's not if 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 an industry like you know energy or automotive indexes seventy percent of its messaging contains a green claim, where less than five percent of their capital expenditures. Uh, fund the green claims that they're marketing, that is a correction that needs to happen. So an independent body could could calculate that and say, well, a fair percentage is, is, is X, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 10%. Um, that is the point of having experts uh, create a construct that the entire industry um, can abide by. That is how we get ahead of the problem at the end of the day, not waiting for an agency to be named and, you know, the ongoing litigation, but proactively uh, getting ahead of this. So who leads that? Who, cr who creates an industry standard? Or as Congress asked you, maybe it's litigation, or, I'm sorry, legislation, where a law will be created in its place, like it's happening in Europe. Who's going to lead a self-regulated industry initiative based on this science? I think the group doesn't exist yet, and I think it would, should be a consortium of existing groups that do exist, including uh, Linda's group. So uh, that's my opinion, having worked on this for seven years and looking at you know the documents and looking at the trends and litigation trends and so forth. Um, I really do believe it's a consortium solution, but it we need clear standards, and those standards need to be revisited on a periodic basis. And I think I, IAE really wants to bring those groups together. I mean, I think that is our job. This has been very helpful and we really wanna bring the groups together to solve these issues. Um, if, if I could interject one more question, um, I wanna push back a little bit what Christine said about um, the semaphore example of Chevron sponsoring um, the editorial content and ask, aren't fossil fuel companies doing a good thing if they're providing advertising dollars to support and sustain wholesome, legitimate editorial coverage of climate policy and change. And why is that bad? And I understand it over indexes that public reputation, but it's doing it in the right way where they're under, to Wally's point, it's about consumer information power. If journalists are out there, that's how they get educated, right? So, you know, where is the line? I know native content, where the New York Times is publishing pieces for Exxon, you know, that's one thing. But why shouldn't fossil fuel companies sponsor good, wholesome journalism? 
I would like to answer this or, or, or Ben Franton, would you like to answer this? <laughs> sure. Just, sure. Just a thought, you know, I think the problem isn't the sponsorship per se. The problem is the misleading advertising. It's the misleading communication. So, you know, I think it's absolutely right that there, it comes in degrees, you know, some of these um, brought to you by Chevron, just to use that as the example brought to you by Chevron, you know, and by the way, we're a, we're a clean energy company, you know, that contains the misleading communication within the advertisement. But, you know, arguably, even a climate story that just says brought to you by Chevron, that that sort of uh, gives a misleading impression by by association. Now, I don't know that I think maybe that would be harder to argue in a case. Um, but, you know, for the time being, we're seeing a lot of um, um, arguably misleading communications in in the ad itself you know this like you know that chevron is spending a lot of money on carbon capture that's the classic example of you know i personally saw an ad like this from from exxon mobile not too long ago that said hey we spent um a million dollars or something like that said it last year the year before on carbon capture and then omitting how much they spent on fossil fuel of course so it's giving that overall misleading impression of the company's activities that's the problem um okay. you know so it's that sponsor. strings attached sponsorship essentially that's i that's would also the say yeah there's data that shows that fossil fuel influence absolutely affects the integrity of academic research so when fossil fuel companies sponsor academic research it tends to bias that research peer-reviewed studies show that similar studies show the same trend in journalism now whether that bias is real or perceived there is, a, this was Bill Spindle's point. Um, he, he illustrates it on his Twitter uh, page where he talks about the fact that, you know, there is that perceived influence that that advertiser will uh, influence the quality of journalism. But it's also similar to, you know, sending 700 fossil fuel industry lobbyists to COP. Uh, they're not there to sell products. They're not advertising their products. They're there to influence the way people think about climate change and what the real solutions are. If you look at the content of all of the ads they're running against these editorials, to, to Ben's point, they are, again, marketing themselves as solutionists um, to a problem they have yet to fully acknowledge they are causing while not disclosing their contributions to that challenge. So, Therein lies the problem. <laughs> uh, can I just jump in? Because you could also, you could use the framework in this, in the Chevron example, they're trying to borrow <laughs> Semaphore's climate newsletter to, to greenwash, um, to like co-sign, to make their other claims seem more legitimate, right? And so the thing to be careful of is it both undermines the credibility of the climate newsletter and it gives this sense of the the industry trying to use them as a shield essentially it seems defensive like on top of all the things that we know about this influencing um mm -hmm. actual coverage i think you can look at it um and i would put it under in our framework just not credible it's trying to make consumers feel green about something that isn't and can't be so thank you all for giving me a headline for tomorrow's media post, which is that even just sponsorship of editorial content can be um, a liability. <laughs> thank you. I think we're out of time, but I don't I don't know how the uh, IAE wants to manage the closure here. Thank you, Joe, to our promise of the time. So thank you so much. And next week, everyone on this call will receive follow-up frameworks and tools that can be easily applied at work. The IAE is an all stakeholder organization, like Wally mentioned. We welcome collaboration from all parties. Visit our website, iaethics.org. Call us at 212-209-3999 for more information. Many thanks to our moderator, Joe, and our panel, and you, the community, for your interest and your attention. Thank you once again and have an excellent rest of your day.